Growth Wisdom with Jason McFadden today. He's Vice President Growth at Build with Assembly. He's also a serial entrepreneur. He's got a couple of startups under his belt. We're going to talk about his musical background, which is super interesting. Going to talk about growth, uh, CPO ship as well. So Chief Product Officer he is or, or was, uh, let me say, at this uh, past startup called Book for Time. Super interesting guy altogether. He's been at a bunch of uh, conferences lately. We're going to talk about that as well. Jason, can you briefly introduce yourself? Tell us a bit more about your companies. Sure. So I'm a tech entrepreneur. I've had a successful exit, have the war wounds that many of us have, uh, and two decades of experience focused on building disruptive startups into market leaders. I know you mentioned Book for Time. So that's definitely one of my more notable achievements. They're now the world's largest spa software platform, processing over $2.5 billion in 70 countries worldwide with no uh, VC capital. Uh, and more recently, alongside my two closest best friends, uh, we've scaled Build with Assembly into a leading cloud consultancy uh, that modernizes, builds, and operates cloud native infrastructure and software uh, for enterprise giants and some of the fastest growing SaaS companies in the tech industry. And you're a carrot activist, I've heard. I, I am. Well, my natural path would be very, very happy to hear that. I'm, I'm eating my daily dose of carrots and getting vitamin A for the gut <laughs> barrier and all of the other good things to keep me seeing for many years beyond. Well, you look uh, good, yeah. man. Um, you know, I talked with you. a bunch of folks and you can see it um, in their face, you know, like how they look. I also see that you have some sun exposure or is that a, a light yeah. or is it the sun? It is actually the sun. I'm I'm directly facing this massive window it, in in my. So full you've got your and, sun exposure. You've got your carrots. Um. Yeah, by the exactly. way, there's like a some type of synergy. I'll advance myself here with beta carotene. Uh, and the sun, uh, you see it in the tone of people's yeah. face. You know when you have when you combine both. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if you knew, but I'm like uh, deep into biohacking. My first uh business was a nootropic. Let's get on with uh, the oh, first wow. topics. Uh, we the first topics we we have here. Uh, first one with being music. So you kind sure. of surprised me last time yeah. by telling me that you that musicians or some class of musicians, more like it, you know, that are accepted in prestigious yeah. universities suffer from a lot of pressure. Um, apparently, yep. the professors are kind of OCD and, and you mentioned that they lost empathy and so forth. You referred yeah. me to the movie Whiplash, which I yeah. rechecked the preview. I didn't recheck the movie because, yeah, it's a, it's a busy life. Um, yeah. Tell us about that past life of yours and how it influenced your startups and uh, your leadership roles, aka the, yeah, that you occupied in the last few yeah. years. So, I mean, I think uh, there's actually several probably skills that I gained through music that that helped me uh, become the entrepreneur I am today. The first one would be hustle. If you want to make money in music, you have to be extremely aggressive uh, at not only just booking gigs, finding the right band members to play with. Uh, you got to learn marketing. You have to learn how to sell yourself. You have to learn how to promote yourself. Um, and then obviously build a following of people who are as passionate about music as you are and get fulfilled by listening to the songs that you create and the music that you uh, develop with your fellow musicians. So uh, and also you're running a business at the end of the day, like every gig you play is revenue and, you know, where you spend that is really important. And often I think it's kind of overlooked. Musicians don't have the the consistent salaries. They don't often have benefits. And so you also learn like how important it is to take care of your health. And that's kind of, you know, a little bit of my journey where, you know, you would, you would go to school, you would play for 10 plus hours a day. You're in a room with 99% of the people being, you know, absolute creative geniuses. But with that comes, you know, this, uh, a lot of emotion. Let's, let's use that as, as the framework. And so you get a lot of pe people that are passionate about their their instrument, passionate about music. And so it does create a, a culture of perfectionism. I think that's one thing that I learned not to carry on into entrepreneurship, right? Like failure, uh, you know, there's beautiful mistakes in failure. And in music, we often try to make it sound perfect, especially in the schools that we go to. Um, but I can guarantee you there's no two, two sets that are played the same. Uh, in, in one city on one stage by the same band. And so, yeah, I think, 
it's also the dedication, right? So you're playing 10 hours a day. And then at the same time, you're going out to, to make a living and doing gigs, right? And you're building your reputation and your brand and, um, and honing your craft at the same time. So I would say uh, music and entrepreneurship, actually, now that I'm reflecting on it, have so much in, in common. Um, it's just the expression in which you use your, your skill or your, your gift that you've been given. Let's jump straight into the fact that, yeah, like if you want to reach the top, it's a jungle. Uh, what does it take to succeed at the top in business in general? Yeah, uh, to, see, to succeed at top, you know, performing at, at the top level in business, I think it's it's years of practice. It's years of honing that skill that you are very good at. It's being able to say what you do in a single sentence and knowing the... Uh, the audience that you're talking to and how you can add value to them. I've, I've become a really big believer of walking into rooms and really focusing on not what they can do for you or pitching what you do, but really thinking strategically about how you can set yourself apart and be different than the other person that might be coming in. And a lot of that is just by taking the time to know who you're meeting with and how you can help them. Um, and sometimes it's going as far as, as really demonstrating that, bringing them to speaking engagements, um, you know, bringing them to special events that they wouldn't have access to, introducing them to someone that you know would be of value to them. So I think it's, you know, like at its core, it's being a good human, leading with value, uh, knowing that you're going to fail a lot and building the resilience, the emotional intelligence, the strong support network uh, to get you through those, those rocky uh, parts. And then I think, you know, even getting into entrepreneurship, that leads to success. It's really the problem that you choose to solve. Many people have the same idea. And so, you know, I have this, this theory on the art of falling in love with the problem. And it's really, you know, if you think about an onion, it's peeling back the layers until you get right to the core and you can start to see, you know, what was the idea for your business may not actually be the most profitable. And there's a smaller problem, easier to solve that's adjacent to that one uh, that can get you faster to market, help you raise less money, uh, and potentially even get to that other larger problem, uh, but in time. Right. And then um, founding team. I think that's another key ingredient to success. You need a really good core team around you to complement you. And that's kind of why I said at the beginning, know what you do very well and what you don't and build your team around them, around your, your areas of uh, strength and weakness, and then uh, get out of their way. And How can sure. you operate in the 1% use stress zone? Because I see a lot of founders and CEOs just going over the top and going in the burnout uh, susceptible zone. It's not the zone necessarily where you instantly burn out, but it's a zone in which you're susceptible to suffering yeah. many blows and injuries to the, the brain, the psyche that might have you out of order in recovery mode for quite some time. I think the use use stress zone is a zone that yeah only one percent of people know know how to operate in which is just enough to create growth and just enough that it's almost the near, near the limit of what you can achieve without burning out how do you stay in that zone so i think yeah, there's many different uh ways to do that um and it's something that i think everyone will still struggle with it's just we get better uh, at dealing with that high level of stress and so um, you know, for, I, actually, this is a really good example. Yeah. Uh, so they took, uh, 20,000 PhD students in the U S they separated them into two groups. And, you know, when you're doing a PhD, you're, you're basically unpacking and solving a very big problem or presenting your, your thoughts on how this could solve a problem. And, uh, all they asked one group to do was work out one more hour than they did previously. And the results were 50% of them graduated sooner. Uh, and, and again, the composition between these two groups was, was fairly similar. So I think it's also being able to pull out of, of what you are doing to get fresh perspective, whether that be through, you know, meditation or, you know, going on a, on a road bike or, you know, hanging out of the cottage with friends. I think it's a balance and, you know, I think also entrepreneurship's created this culture that there's, you know, time is is finite, and that is very true. Um, but there's a lot of value in getting to the end of the race and not burning out. And so, 
it's that 80 20 uh, it's figuring out what is actually moving the needle and focusing on that and following that process uh we all chase carrots as entrepreneurs just building upon the carrot uh comment from earlier but uh that carrot keeps on pushing itself further and further away. And if you get ingrained in the process into the, into those little needles that are working for you and are, are inching towards progress, you will get to the outcome that you seek. Um, and it's just, again, being in that process, being in that, in that moment. And then I would say, you know, having a, a really strong support network, um, and that can come from founders, that can come from advisors. I know this is advice we always hear. And so my thought to that is make sure they're strategic. If you're going through a specific problem, you don't need to necessarily go to your core mentor. You can go to someone else who's struggled with it and reach out to them and get their advice. Yeah. Um, yeah. I even use this podcast as, or any call I get with anyone. I First, I, I tell the truth, you know, when people tell me how am, am I feeling, you know, like... Uh, Am I feeling um, busy? Am I feeling overwhelmed? And so forth. So and and then you can talk with other founders and entrepreneurs. In my case, it's the only folk that I is the 80, 90% of folks that I speak to on a daily basis. Masterminds are also cool for that. Um mm -hmm. yeah, that these are, are good um to rely on, especially in your tough moments. And yeah, I, I don't think we're at the stage of having people like listen to us as entrepreneurs like mostly solutions hey do you have a solution for me at this level well yeah. in my case so yeah that it's certainly uh helpful i can i can see that in yeah multiple entrepreneurs that are are some somehow like pushing the the envelope a bit uh a bit too far you know and um, especially during tiring times i think it's also how you think you know do you do you think uh, that you're struggling every day or do you think that you're growing every day? You know, I had, I had a mastermind call yesterday with some of my peers and, you know, like one of them is always like, Oh yeah, this is hard, but yeah, you need to expect this to be hard. And the, the real question is, are you growing for people mm -hmm. also that it, it's all about revisiting your thought, you know, like me, I don't operate in time. I mostly operate in energy um mm. energy is the key if i spend five minutes with an incredibly toxic person how yeah. how about that five minute that i spend with uh tony robbins in a pep talk uh, you know uh, yeah. it's not the same uh, time that we're talking about energy you'll be feeling great for months and uh, exactly that that, that, yeah so energy roi great. you know um mostly and I, i'd also uh, encourage people to revisit their their thoughts you know is time really limitless is mortality a thing, you know, mm -hmm. that it, mortality is a thing because there's not been someone that invented something. Uh, there was darkness before there was electricity, you know? So I, I think people kind of need to revisit that. And for me, it's, it's why I'm obsessed with longevity. I really want to crack the code and yet yeah, I'll, I'll dedicate m most of my life to it. I'll die trying at least. Um, going on a tangent here but uh last time we spoke about you going to multiple conferences this is an yeah. aspect that i am highly curious in how you got all these panel talks is it like referrals and so forth and how yeah. do you see them playing when it comes to increasing your network and your network because you're obviously closing yeah. a bunch of deals in in between yeah. so i i mean often we get stuck working uh, in the business rather than on the business. And so I look at this as one of those activities where it gets you outside and gets you talking to your target audiences. Some audiences that aren't even your target audience can influence where your product direction will go. Um, you know, I look at, at, at conferences as, as, you know, we all had, we all went through COVID in various different degrees and conferences came back to life. And, you know, I went from a perspective of, I wasn't really missing much by not being involved in them to being like, how did I go three years not attending a conference? Um, the amount of relationships I've built, the amount of new friendships, the the time uh, condensed drastically when meeting someone in person to when you can help them uh, add value in their life or in their business and vice versa. Um, that was actually probably one of my shocking you know, uh, epiphanies, even the sense of like lead generation and prospect generation, totally different 
types of opportunities, like larger uh, scale deals that, you know, we probably wouldn't have been even on their radar. Um, and it was just being in the right place at the right time, having the smarts uh, to deal with that situation and have an engaged full conversation where you've generated enough interest in that prospect to then remember you for days to come and say, now I've got something that we should think about working on or collaborating on together. As far as you know, how do you get out there and start socializing the amazing thing that you're building and the, the awesome team that's supporting, you know, the vision and executing against the vivid future. Um, that takes time. Uh, you know, I remember 20 years ago going to my first digital conference, it was called Mesh. And then 20 years later, they rebooted it. So, you know, like the, all the big tech founders in, in Toronto got together 20 years ago, trying to create a community and use this as that way. Um, and they rebooted it because we needed that at that time. We still need that strong connection to community and people. Getting on those stages, though, it's about building a strong um, reputation for yourself and your business. And it is not a stage to shamelessly promote yourself. And so one of the key ingredients of success is focus on who's there and what are the things that are most important to them. And then you will find interesting ways to, you know, uh, integrate what you do into those narratives. The second thing is you don't have to always give keynotes, sometimes leverage the power of others and their influence to get help you be in a place um, in front of a larger audience. And so panels are a great outlet to do that. Um, and you get a diversity of perspectives and usually a lot more engaging conversations and more people come up to you at the end to say hello because it's less intimidating. Uh, and more open and, and welcoming um, to be in a group of people rather than a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so I've quite I've I've enjoyed it. We're doing uh, Collision, and uh, and that was a big one. That was one of my goals. Be on on stage at Collision. It's one of the largest digital conferences in the world. Back then, it, when I had that goal, it was I've made it when I'm on the stage. Truth is, not yet, but on that journey, and just proud to be there uh, in front of forty five thousand people. Uh, talking about something really important. And so this year's theme for Collision is um, the Olympics of tech. And I love that. Not only do we have an Olympic body as a client, um, but what does that actually mean to be an Olympic, uh, compete at an Olympic scale and be an Olympian in tech? And moreover, at, you know, how does that, you know, uh, what does venture think that looks like? What does an operator think that looks like? And what do the team members that support our, our vivid futures that are in our purpose and reason for being um, think? And so our goal is that we can combine all of these different perspectives to get a clear picture on what does it actually mean to be this? How much is inherent? How much is born? Uh, how much can be learned? Uh, and uh, and yeah, and so we, we've got a great stage with some absolute uh, legends that are Olympians themselves. And uh, yeah, I'm very excited. It's less than seven days away now. Well, yeah, I must feel quite jittery uh, to go on stage with 45K folks. Yesterday, I interviewed like a, a, an idol of mine. I could say I don't like to use that word, but like someone yeah. that I grew up on listening, uh, John Lee Dumas, uh, the podcaster of EO Fire. And very I got jittery, you know, um, yeah. which is very rare sight for me. Um, yeah. How does one manage that? That's a great question. So no matter what stage you get on, whether it's a podcast, TV, panel, 45,000 people, 100 people, it's practice. Uh, I think another skill I learned as a musician playing on very large, large stages very early on was the art of per performance. And so I kind of have a, a framework, shock, awe, uh, delight, and surprise in any order that you want. Um, and so I use that to ground me and keep me focused on why I am there and what I am there to, to do. Um, but I don't think that feeling goes away. And in fact, I actually think that might help you perform better too. It's the fighting that feeling that sometimes leads to the performances that we think we could be better, but more than not, I, you know, like, um, I, I think we're our hardest critics. And we should rather be celebrating the fact that we are on a stage and that people want to actually hear what we have to say and learn about what we're doing and gain some inspiration or some new perspectives. 
Um, and so gratitude journals has really helped me in, you know, uh, kind of taking a, what would be like a nervous, nervous, uh, situation being up on, up on stage or leading a panel, wondering what people will say, um, and just being ready for whatever that, that conversation takes us, um, and just being grateful for that moment. And, and also at the end of the day, it's only one appearance and probably, in another year, there'll be another appearance and they'll be thinking about that one too. So yeah, I, and practice. I think practice is the, the key there. I'll follow up with two weird biohacks. One is one that you're using right, right now, sun exposure. It relaxes yeah. you. Second yeah. is sauna, which is somewhat related to, to that as well. Uh, yeah. I would highly recommend both and or uh, cold uh, ice bath as well. Uh, you guys I have a nice one in baths. Toronto, the other yeah. ship, which is a company I'm, I'm working on. By the way, they're opening a new one in Are Toronto. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, you, you should visit them. Um, I love it. I've gone a few times now. Love it. Nice. Uh, two mental models behind uh, being at conferences then i want to follow up with a question first is yeah you've mentioned it you know covid so everything's online nowadays if you go yeah. physical this means uh that you are interrupting patterns this means that you are not going against the flow mm -hmm. people will notice um, it's different right and people uh, have this desire for more connection so that is one strong mental model at play here behind the, the why uh, to show up physically to places, even though you might have to take uh, your car and so forth and get there. Yeah. Even better if you can walk or bike you know, like uh, Jason exactly. would. And the, yeah. the second part is that it feels more real, right? Um, it, if you see, yeah. I mean, Gary V has been quite heavy on the, the physical space. We've seen it with my first million guys as well on their podcast. So it, it just feels more weird, real. Now, my favorite question is how can I scale that? You know, how can I get mm. myself invited at scale to these conferences? It's just, is it just like pure brand people talking about me? Can I outreach to these folks and just ask yeah. them to be a panelist and send them a, a, one of these podcasts and tell them like, Hey, what do you think? Do you, do you think I, I could be an eccentric uh, thinker mm. slash question asker at your event what what yeah. do you think do you think it's no, scalable they they get a lot of that and so you really have to cut through the noise and and the the way that i found that is get to the founders of these conferences in whatever way shape or form um and that's again why building that uh reputation and that brand for yourself is so important because that's probably where they're going to go look first is on linkedin and see what you've accomplished and what you've done um and then, you know, rather than pitching, I want to be a panelist or I want to be, uh, you know, a keynote note speaker, it's actually truly understanding what are they trying to achieve this year? Where are they? What's keeping them up at night? How can you help them? And then if that leads to an opportunity where you can speak or um, be part of a panel, that will naturally help, and help happen because if you're good to them, they will be good to you. Um, I don't think it means you need to sponsor. We've spent uh, zero dollars to be on any stage. And I don't see us spending money to ever be on a stage because it's not authentic and real then. Uh, and then it's not to discredit anyone who does. It's just not who we are as builders. And uh, and moreover, not, not uh, I'd rather invest that money in, in something else more meaningful, like feeding people uh, at those conferences than paying to, to, to speak. Um, so... I think also it's understanding gaps in their content. So they program, you know, content to address certain audiences, figure out the audience that you most represent, uh, you know, strongly rep uh, are represented within, uh, and then have others reach out on your behalf. Uh, people are generally more interested to meet someone if they've, they've been told about a person a few times. Uh, you, you spark curiosity. And we're all curious uh, as, as humans. And so we often want to understand why am I getting referred to this person several times? And so that same advice, to be honest, is the same of like, how do you land your, your first foundational client that will help you grow your business, right? It's, it's more organic um, than it is. Sorry, I think it's more um, pull than push, but you need both working at the same time, I think, in order for success to happen. Um, and then how do you scale that? 
honestly, I'm still figuring that out because, um, yeah, that's just the honest answer. I, I don't know because that also means scaling it. It's a change in your company culture. So let's say you're an organization where, you know, if you've got your, your front, uh, you know, your, your, on your leadership team, there's going to be those who are comfortable doing these types of things and those that are not. Um, and so, you know, obviously there's skill development and there's programs, maybe it's, um, you know, mocks with, with team members, but that only gets you so far. And at some point, someone needs to be personally motivated in order to want to do that. And so I think it's really taking inventory of those on your team who light up when you say you're speaking at a conference and ask them to come, ask them to experience it, ask them to, you know, see it through your eyes. And then if they are open to participating, maybe it's getting them to talk about a subject that they know inside and out, that they are experts in and figuring out what place is best for them uh, to speak about that. And whether it's beneficial to the business or not, it's building that, again, like learning an instrument, learning how to ride a bike, the more you do it, the more they can become more comfortable to talk about many different right. subjects. Yeah. Yeah. We've seen Kara Fisher and uh, Jason Calcanis uh, scale yeah. that. And I think uh, through their pods would be most of the answer. But yeah, scale is hard, you know, scale. Well, control controlled scale that oh, is controllable yeah. it's always hard to to scale that jason thank you so much for showing up no today problem. sharing your wisdom where can people find out more about you yeah linkedin would be great uh just search for jason mcfadden in toronto and build with assembly uh i just actually before we go i want to go back i think this is important um it's also not everyone in your company needs to be uh speaking on stages i think it's important to have a few voices within the company so that messages are clear and concise. Uh, and the more that those things are repeated, the more that people understand what you do, you start to build stronger brand awareness. So I wouldn't want to encourage it to be a company-wide thing, but again, find those people that love it and then ensure that they're the right voices to represent the brand and represent the organization too. Yeah, the head of comms, usually people that are great communicators and that uh, transpire the, the brand. So again, where can people yeah. find out more about you? Yeah, so uh, LinkedIn, uh, Jason McFadden, Build with Assembly, uh, assemblyhq.com. Uh, yeah, those are probably the places that that you can find me uh, and always happy and uh, and willing to uh, to connect with fellow entrepreneurs or, or anyone in that fact uh, where I might be able to help them or vice versa. Thank you so 